like to welcome you all to this um, lunchtime seminar at the Birkbeck Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. Uh, I'm David Feldman, the director of the Institute. And today we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, Ruth Mandel from, uh, from University College London as advertised, but also a Rachel Lair from the University of Colorado Boulder. So it's, um, it's really a twofer. Um, and uh, they'll be speaking on um, a Holocaust counter memorial, Stolper Steiner and competing narratives of history <laughs> and memory. Ruth Mandel teaches in the Department of Anthropology at University College London. She's the author of the prize winning book, Cosmopolitan Anxieties, Turkish Challenges to Citizenship and Belonging in Germany. And, um, and her current research, uh, collaborating with Rachel there, addresses Holocaust memory and commemoration in Europe, focusing on the artist Gunther Demnig's Stolperstein project. And she was one of the organizers of the recent installation of Britain's first Stolperstein, dedicated on the 30th of May this year in London. Rachel Lair has a PhD in linguistics from the University of Chicago. She is the co-author of The Carpet Baggers of Kabul and Other American Afghan Entanglements, published in 2017 and is collaborating <laughs> with Ruth in examining the work of Gunter Demnig and his Stolpersteiner. Um, and, and she began this work as a Fulbright scholar in Norway in 2017. Uh, so um, Ruth and Rachel will present for about half an hour, then we'll open um, uh, the seminar up for questions and discussion. If you do have a question, please raise your virtual hand, or if you don't feel comfortable doing so, place your question in the chat and I'll do my best to reach it. But without any further ado, I'll hand over to Ruth and Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, hi. <clears throat> So thanks to all of you for being interested in our talk today and for taking the time to participate. My name is Ruth Mandel, as David just mentioned, and I'm a professor of anthropology at UCL. My friend and colleague, Rachel Lair and I are thrilled to have a chance to share a bit about our research with you. We'll be talking about the research we've been doing for about seven years all over Europe. And both of us came to the project from very different sorts of research. My original doctoral research, uh, dissertation way back long time ago, focused on issues of identity and ethnicity. Uh, specifically, I researched international migration between Greece, Turkey, and Germany. I spent several years living and researching in Greece, Turkey, and Berlin, where I lived among the so-called guest workers, Gastarbeiter. Being a Jew in Berlin and being frequently mistaken for being Turkish opened my eyes to many dynamics of identity that are still relevant in contemporary Germany and in some ways um, are the underpinnings of our, of our current research. Um, the Turks in particular slotted into the social category that had once been occupied by Jews. In fact, sometimes Turks were called Germany's new Jews. So finally, around seven years ago, I began to carry out research on Stolpersteine, the stumbling stones you see in the picture, um, the topic of today's talk. And not long after I began the research, I talked to Rachel about it and we decided to join forces. We have very complementary skills. And ever since then, it's been a joint endeavor. And now I'll turn over to Rachel who will tell you about her background. Thank you, Ruth. Um... Yeah, my name is Rachel Lair, and most of my career has been spent in and around Afghanistan, I, where I spent many years working and researching. I wrote about a minority language in Afghanistan for my PhD thesis, and my academic work has also focused on Afghan women's leadership and authority. I helped found a rural women's NGO for income generation through local handicrafts, and additionally, I've uh, trained State Department, Defense Department uh, employees in 
Afghan culture before their deployments. Now I'm actually providing guidance and training for the resettlement agencies and volunteers who are welcoming the tens of thousands of Afghans who have arrived in the US. Long before studying Persian, um, the languages of Iran, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan, I had an extensive Jewish education. I attended Jewish day school in the Bronx, where I learned Hebrew and Yiddish from a young age. So this Stolperstein project with Ruth really brings me back to my roots. In 2017, I was a Fulbright scholar in Norway, where I was examining the archive of a Norwegian linguist. While living in Norway, I began to hear in bits and pieces about the story of Norway's collaboration with the Nazis in World War II and the deplorable treatment of the local Jews. Though I had seen Stolperstein in other countries, the way the project was taken up with Nor in Norway really interested me. And when I heard a story about how a Stolperstein, or in Norwegian they say Snublestein, um, was vandalized in a small town outside Oslo, I was hooked. Ruth and I have traveled throughout Europe, especially in the Nordic countries, observing Stolperstein installations, at least until the pandemic hit. So uh, we've delivered multiple uh, um, presentations, we've uh, published about our work and attended conferences where we talk about it as well. We um, plan not to take much more than 30 minutes and you're welcome of course to put your questions in the chat or raise your hand at the end. Our research is a study of Europe's largest decentralized Holocaust memorial, Artist Gunther Demning's Stolpersteine, literally stumbling stones, though some have uh, translated it as stumbling blocks. But rather than sticking up and, and actually tripping on them, the stones are actually flush with the pavement and the stumbling is symbolic. Demning's project hand stamps brass plaques with the name, date, and place of birth and fate of the victims of Nazi persecution. The plaques are installed in front of their former homes. His aim is to return their names to their homes and communities. He often quotes a Jewish source that says, a person is only forgotten when their name is forgotten. The plaques are controversial and have been celebrated, imitated, banned, and vandalized. We're using an ethnographic approach to understand the many meanings of Stolperstein for individuals and groups in various locations. And for the past seven years, we've been following the artist, traveling to nine countries so far to observe installations. Our methodology is what anthropologists call participant observation, which is just that. We went to many dedication ceremonies, sometimes as observers, other times as participants. We've interviewed countless attendees, the organizers, participants, passers-by, sponsors, people who commission stones, descendants, etc. Our goal is to contribute to understandings of how memory is expressed and reproduced. Related to this, we want to examine how this particular memory project can assist in understanding of how Holocaust memory and its denial still resonate today. Currently, there are over 90,000 stones in 28 countries. In each country, the plaque is inscribed in the local language, as you can see here. A typical stone will say, here lived so-and-so, <clears throat> the date and place of their birth, the date of deportation, and the date and place of death, if known. Here we see Greek, German, French, Finnish, and other languages. Many people familiar with the project assume they are just for Jewish victims of Nazi Germany. They are in fact intended for all victims of National Socialism, including resistors, Roma, Sinti, Jehovah's Witnesses, and members of the LGBTQ community, but the overwhelming majority are for Jews. This stone installed in Oslo, Norway commemorates a murdered member of the resistance. Günther Demning grew up in post-war West Germany, the son of a German soldier who told him little about his experiences fighting in the Nazi army. 
typical of his generation who came of age in the 60s, Gunther was politically engaged. He studied art and was heavily influenced by the work and theories of Joseph Beuys, who was known for the conceptual art form he coined social sculpture, a way of thinking about art's potential to transform society. To them, art is inherently political. Demning is open about his heritage. He identifies his own work as a response to his personal legacy. En route to an installation in Norway, one of our companions asked Gunther Demning if he still, quote, still had a chance to make his own art these days. Demning, taken aback, replied, this is the art. It's my Lebenswerk, my life work. And everything that happens after I leave the plaque is also art. This is why we attend installations by observing the many types of ceremonies and rituals, the kinds of participants and what happens subsequently. We gain insight into the variety of memory practices. While to Gunther Demning, Stolpersteine is an ongoing work of art. For many of the sponsors, both descendants and others, the, memory, the memorial is the essential part of it, the, the essential component. The project began in 1996 as a one-off event when Demning clandestinely installed the first 50 stones in Berlin's Kreuzberg district. This was a part of an artist search for Auschwitz project. It was seen and appreciated by a few individuals who then re requested stones for their own murdered relatives. Initially a one-man operation, the artwork evolved organically. For many years, Demning crafted the stones, embossed them, and installed them. As the project became better known, many municipalities began to support him. Eventually, the project expanded today's team of 11 full-time and part-time staff researching countless requests from around the world and organizing nonstop installations. In addition, hundreds of volunteers support the project in various ways, through research, through contacting descendants, maintaining and polishing the stones, organizing installations, fundraising, and more. Until COVID, Demning maintained a rigorous travel schedule, installing 300 days a year. In Norway alone, we followed Gunther over 10,000 kilometers by plane, car, minivan, ferries through fjords and ships from the coastal south to above the Arctic Circle. We also traveled with him to Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Nor um, Germany and Greece. And in all these sites, we observed installation events with as many as 250 attendees and as few as none. We documented dedication ceremonies, interviewed participants and organizers, until the pandemic curtailed our movements and his. In the past two years, we've been able to conduct interviews thanks to Zoom. People have reached out to us and shared their homemade recordings, films, pictures, and material objects, all related to their experience of participating in this project. Demnig's motto is one person, one stone. To him, this means that each individual death is acknowledged. These micro memorials contrast to large, often abstract Holocaust memorials that commemorate the six million. The individual nature of each Stolperstein opens a window into a specific life. Stolpersteine deliberately are not mass produced. <clears throat> These days, they are individually embossed one by one by Demnig's colleague, Michael Friedrich Friedlander. Demnig made a decision not to expand production, despite the growing demand. Instead, he, created, he creates each individual plaque one at a time, recognizing the individual's identities, their murders, and hence renders them unforgettable. A nameless, a, a personal engagement with ordinary, until now, nameless individuals recognizes a life lived and a life taken away. Demnig insists that direct attention is paid to each individual through the slow artisanal creation of each brass plaque. 
In this way, the stumbling stones represent the antithesis to the mechanization of Nazi mass murder that denied individuals not only their lives, but their names. To the extent possible, Gunther installs the stones himself. The Stolpersteine project is the world's largest decentralized memorial. This project is both small and expansive, international and intimate, symbolic and literal. Gunther Demnig chose the epithet Stolperstein or stumbling stone as a reference to the random nature of encountering them. They are meant to be stumbled across and over. They, the, additionally, it bears its impl the implication of obstruction, such as stumbling block in English. Demnig has stated that the intention is for pedestrians to stumble with their hearts and minds. To Demnig, his artwork will never be complete. He recognizes that it is not possible to place stones for all victims. Stolpersteine installations are planned far in advance. The Stolperstein may be commissioned by individuals such as descendants, grassroots neighborhood organizations, schools, churches, or municipalities and state sponsorship. The waiting list can be two years or more. Sponsors are required to provide documentation about the individuals and where they lived before a stone can be ordered. Sponsors are encouraged to reach out to identify if there are any descendants to let them know about the plans. Often municipalities in Germany in particular provide assistance in the research. Attentive to kinship, he thoughtfully places the stones in familial <clears throat> arrangements. The stones for children are placed between parents. As he told us, now the parents can protect their child as if holding their hands. He often arranges familial generations in horizontal rows. The process of installation is iterative for Demnig. He revisits many locations annually and some more frequently to add stones, thereby ensuring a continuity of both attention and engagement. Here in Helsinki, Finland, the stone in the center memorializes a one-year-old child, his parents on either side. In many instances, the sponsors plan a dedication ceremony to accompany the installation. One of the many sites we visited, of the many sites we visited, we observed a wide variety of dedications. Some had music, flowers, photographs, speeches, prayers. All of them included biographies read out. These familiar memory practices and gestures might be seen as conventional. But we also observed less familiar practices and novel rituals that raised questions, particularly regarding seemingly dissonant practices. In some cases, we observed non-Jews performing their own familiar mourning rituals that theologically conflict with those of the Jewish individuals being mourned. At one installation in Berlin, we noted the thought that had gone into a quite elaborate dedication that included music, candles, photographs, singing, song sheets, and speeches. The biography of the Kassir family's lives, uh, you see three of the Kassir family stones here. Um, and at this, one, at this um, ritual memorial, it included musical selections. In fact, we were led in a three-part round of the song Zoom Gali Gali, which is an Israeli folk song celebrating pioneering and working the land. And we were told that it was chosen deliberately because one of the victims had been part of a pre-war socialist Zionist youth group. The tune was a striking and surprising choice. It reflected the amount of nuanced research that had gone into the preparation for the ceremony. We don't know how this song resonated for the descendants and organizers of the events who were not themselves Jewish. But for both Rachel and me, it was quite evocative since it was a song we had both sung in our youth. Another installation in Berlin actually was a reinstallation in, the fr in front of the former pharmacy owned by Adolf Mokrauer. Mokrauer had been hounded out of Berlin by Nazis who took over and Aryanized his store. 
He fled to South America, where he then took his own life. The original Stolperstein for him had been vandalized by neo-Nazis the year before, along with quite a few others in the area. Gunther Demning is adamant about replacing any vandalized Stolperstein. And this reinstallation became a political rally. As the crowd gathered, anti-fascist banners were unfurled. Political figures, among them the local mayor, national politicians, international, national, and local media were present. We couldn't help but wonder about the primary draw that attracted such an enormous group. Was it in solidarity against the growing neo-Nazi movement? Or were they there to commemorate this particular individual persecute, persecuted Jew? <clears throat> in various locations, there are friends of Stolperstein groups that monitor the conditions of the stones. They polish them for special on special days such as Kristallnacht, or Yom HaShoah and other meaningful times. They monitor vandalism or damage. One person told us, I feel as though I have a personal relationship with these dead. I see them and remember them every time I pass by. I nod to them, acknowledge them. I know each individual's history. I think about the books that didn't get written, the music that was not composed, the families whose lines were cut short. Another remark that while she polishes stones, she imagines the lives of the individuals memorialized. School students so sometimes make rubbings as part of their Holocaust curriculum. We attended the first ever Stolperstein installation in Sweden in 2019, where three stones were dedicated. Though Sweden claimed to be neutral in the war, numerous Jewish residents, all stateless refugees were deported and killed. Post-war scholars have delved into the putative neutrality and have shown the many ways that Sweden accommodated the Nazi regime. These stones mark an important reckoning with complicity and are not uncontroversial precisely for that reason. The first dedication attended by numerous international dignitaries was for Eric Hollowa, who had been born in Berlin in 1896, fled to Sweden in 1938, <clears throat> only to be deported and killed in In Western Norway, population 360, the musicians played a tune we did not recognize. We asked the musician what he had chosen to play, and he was astonished that we did not know the melody. He proudly announced that it was the theme to Schindler's, to Spielberg's Schindler's List by John Williams. Ever since the widespread dissemination and popularity of Schindler's List, some scholars have wondered about the film's legacy. Most agree that it would preserve the memory of the Holocaust. However, some wondered if it would restrict and mold the memory in problematic ways. Over the past couple decades, Schindler's List has indeed become inextricably linked with the Holocaust in popular culture. It often serves as a shorthand via Hollywood for the atrocity. later, we heard the Schindler theme performed in Stockholm. <clears throat> the performance of the theme to Schindler's List in rural Norway and Stockholm, Sweden, reinforced the dominance of the American Holocaust narrative in the Scandinavian collective memory of historical events. 
For many, this film has become more than simply an introduction to the Holocaust. Instead, it symbolically becomes its memory, if not the event itself. The Hollywood-generated Holocaust theme song has itself become the generic emblem of this atrocity. In contrast to the shorthand stereotypes for Jews and Holocaust re represented by the Schindler's music, at installations in Copenhagen, we heard something starkly different. In 2019, Denmark, like Sweden, also received its very first Dolpesteine. The initial dedication was attended by several hundred members of the Danish Jewish community, as well as local and foreign dignitaries. A violinist was accompanied by a singer who sang the song Rojinkes mit Mandlin, Raisins and Almonds. This is a beloved Yiddish lullaby popularized through an arrangement by Abraham Goldfaden as part of his opera Shulamis in 1880. Approximately 250 people watched Debnik dig into the pavement and place three stones, after which the music was performed. Attendees spontaneously sang or hummed along, many weeping openly, deeply moved by the familiar music. The Yiddish lullaby tells of a snow white kid goat under the cradle that will be traded at market for raisins and almonds. Near the end of this excerpt, you can hear many voices joining in as a woman wipes her tears. Denmark is well known for having saved its Jews in a famous flotilla that ferried thousands of them to safety in nearby Sweden. <clears throat> However, less well known is the unfortunate story of those several hundred who were arrested and died in concentration and death camps. When we interviewed the singer, a cantor, he explained, I could have chosen a Holocaust song or a ghetto song, but selected this lullaby for the grandmothers being memorialized. The power of music to evoke painful and cherished memories was brought to the fore in the, these dedications. 
At many of the Stolperstein installations organized or attended by Jews, Kaddish and or El Mola Rachamim were recited. Here in Oslo is a descendant saying Kaddish. We listened to the Kaddish recited in the English translation at a ceremony in Berlin for a recently deceased elderly man whose life had been saved by having been on a kinder transport. His widow, children, and grandchildren had traveled from Manchester, England to Berlin for the dedication. Recognizing the prayer in its English translation, we were then taken aback at the new ending, which tacked on a mention of Jesus Christ. Another Stolperstein inspired memorial is in the Polish city of Breslau. A group of school children at the Shalom Aleichem Jewish Elementary School had hoped to install Stolpersteine. They wanted to memorialize Paul Ehrlich, architect and resident of the building that housed their school. He and his family were murdered at the Theresienstadt camp. Because commissions for Stolpersteine had a long waiting list, they devised their own solution. They painted gold on the flagstones in front of the school to imitate Stolpersteine. The many small stones surrounding the text represent the Jewish traditional memory practice of placing stones on graves. Although this is a graveyard practice, these are not graves. No one was buried here. As Demning's vision is to place stones, Stolperstein stones, where people lived, not died, the fact that they often are treated as gravestones demonstrates how they become charged sites of memory with multiple meanings, including standing in for an absent gravestone. <clears throat> Californian Howard Shatner, the descendant of Nazi victims, decided to personalize the dedication process for the Berlin Stolpersteine he commissioned. He cut and pounded these copper tokens with the Hebrew word for life, Chaim, to be buried under the stones. For Demning, Stolpersteine are about the symbolic returning of the murdered to their residents. By preserving their names, their memories are restored. By contrast, for some descendants, it's about remembering specific relatives and creating a place to mark and express their individual grief to gain closure. To Demning, there cannot ever be closure. To him, the art project is endlessly iterative. However, for Shatner and others, there is a finality and specificity. At the same time, many descendants appreciate the prestige of being part of a larger international community of remembrance. For Demning, Stolpersteine are about the symbolic returning of the murdered to their residents by preserving their names, their memories are restored. By contrast, to the, I'm sorry, we, that was written twice. Um, yeah. Um, next, slide. And, next slide. Yeah. Here you see um, this was just this was from a Stolperstein um, installation just a couple of weeks ago in Berlin, where um, the descendants who had commissioned them decided to put the six pointed Jewish star underneath the stones. We're actually on the next slide. Okay. On May 30th. Yeah. Right, right. On May 30th, London joined the rest of Europe in becoming the site of a Stolperstein. This one for Ada von Danzig. Ada was a Dutch woman working in a paintings conservation studio in Golden Square, Soho. Upon learning that her family's situation was worsening in the late 1930s, she returned to the Netherlands and tried to help them escape. Instead, they were arrested deported and killed in Auschwitz. Although she was not directly deported from London, Gunther decided that her exceptional situation warranted a stone. 
two days later, on June 1st, Ireland became the 28th country with Stolpersteine. The six shown here commemorate Irish citizens and residents caught up in Europe and unable to escape. These stones in Ireland and England are the first, but may not be the last. For example, several people are working now on trying to gain permission to bring Stolpersteine to the Channel Islands, where Jews and others were arrested and deported to internment and death camps. As we continue to research and write about this ever expanding project, we've made a number of observations. We've noticed that these stones are installed for a variety of reasons by a variety of actors. In some cases, such as Norway, the government sponsored the installation of one Stolperstein for each of the 764 murdered Norwegian Jews. While this comprehensive effort honors the memories of these individuals, it does nothing to address Norway's role in their murders. The issue of Norwegian complicity in World War II atrocities is only recently being publicly debated. In Finland, we noticed a conflict between the group that commissioned the stone and the local Jewish community. Not only did they not share the planning and sponsorship, but the stone was installed on a Shabbat, causing offense to many in the Jewish community. Such issues raise questions such as, whom are they for? Why are they commissioned? Do they serve larger social and political purposes? To what extent and are they used for ongoing memorialization and education in the days, months, and years following the installations? These are just a few of the questions that inform our current and future research. So at this point, we'll finish and thank you for your attention and we look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you so much, Ruth and Rachel, for are a really absolutely fascinating and, and at times moving uh, presentation. We have to end quite sharply today at two. So because of that, um, I'll, um, I'll, um, I will uh, forego a question myself and simply uh, and ask people to, um, um, to raise their hands um, electronically if they have a question. There are also some questions in the chat that I'll move to um, uh, initially. Um, so um, one question for, uh, from Joshua Levin is, uh, 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 what tolerance does Demnig have for the application of the Stolpostino model to other atrocities around the world? including the enslavement of humans in the United States. How would developers of such an idea get in touch with him to explore? So, um, so uh, Ruth or Rachel, would you like to have a go at that first about uh, uh, um, how a universal mm -hmm. or universalizable um, mm -hmm. a Demnig uh, a thinks, of his, a, a thinks of his project? Sure. I'll, I'll Rachel, jump on that one. Yeah, I'll just jump on that. Actually, it was a, It has been part of our previous talk, but since we weren't speaking to an American audience, we took it out. Um, so thank you for that question. We there is actually two projects that are in New England, one in Vermont and one in I think Massachusetts or Connecticut. One is called Witness Stones, and the other one is called Stopping Stones. Stopping Stones. Thank you. And they both projects have uh, uh, Demnig's endorsement. And one of them is more of a teaching project, an educational tool, the other is not, but they place the same sort of stone in front of homes or places where people had been enslaved at one time. And they simply have the name of that person and say that they were enslaved because there's not all that much information, but actually it's quite, uh, it's quite um, expandable, this project. So yes, it's already happening. And if I can add to that, um the universalizable universal yeah um 
is, is we've seen this in other places as well. Um, for example, in the former Soviet Union, um, a historian, political journalist who's Ukrainian actually, uh, saw the Stolpersteine in Berlin and decided he wanted to um, do something similar in the former Soviet Union for people who had been victims of uh, Stalinist gulags. And so there are many, many um, plaques not put on the pavement on, or sidewalk, but put on sides of buildings um, marking where they lived. And there's many, many other similar projects around the world. Um, and there's a lot of copycat projects in Europe, people who don't want to wait their turn for the genuine article from Demnig have started um, manufacturing their own in a couple of places. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Ruth. Um, there's, um, I see that uh, Jennifer Langer has her hand raised, but um, I'll just go to, to Jennifer Putnam's question in the chat first, or, or two questions. Does Demnig, Demnig have to get permission from local government to place these stones, and what's that process like? And are there stones in Yiddish anywhere? He does have to get permission. Um, and some places, um, you know, the, the, the local municipalities are extremely welcoming and supportive. Uh, the Berlin city government has people on their salary uh, who are employed by them being paid salary just to facilitate uh, Demning's um, project. Other places have banned them. In Munich, they're banned. That's a whole other story. Um, he's tried to get them put in Poland. Um, the governments have been very, local governments have been very obstructive. So it, there's not one answer. It depends on the place. And as far as we know, we, we haven't seen any in Yiddish, um, but that's a really good question. And we will look into that. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, uh, Jennifer, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes. Um, given Poland's position of denial about its complicity in the Holocaust, I was surprised when you mentioned that there was a waiting list for Stolpersteiner to be installed in Breslau um sort of my my situation is that my mother was from berlin and stolpersteiner has been installed there for her family but my father was from the breslau area which was germany of course and then in 1945 became poland so i'm intrigued you know to know what the position is now um regarding poland's attitude towards stolpersteiner and then the other thing is I was wondering about the Germans' perspective towards the Stolpersteiner. Yes, some are very supportive and come along to the ceremonies and indeed even conduct research into families' um, backgrounds. Um, but you mentioned the defacement of Stolpersteiner and are the Germans, for example, do they articulate resentment about kind of being forced to, to, um, to feel guilt, to, um, you know, to express guilt through stumbling over these stones? Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Rachel, do you want to take that or should I? Uh... <laughs> I was going to leave that one to you because you're okay. All right. But only, to, um, only just to say that there is a lot of different people with a lot of different ideas. I, I wouldn't even begin to characterize. <laughs> yeah, um, just your first question about Poland. Um, that was the, the school situation that we found in Breslau. Um, the reason was that the school was moving to a different premises. And so before they left, they wanted to put one in. So it was a very quick um, project so they didn't have time to ha there wasn't time for them to be produced and in that case I, they could have been put in there um, probably because it was private property but in Poland um, there, there's been many many obstructionist local municipalities and it's the local not the national for the most part uh, so um, 
that's Poland. Um, but having said that, a couple two years ago, um, he did put some in the town of, Aus of Auschwitz, Auschwitz. So uh, it, it, there are some, but very few. There's not a single one in Warsaw, not a single one in Krakow. So that tells you something. Um, in Germany, the, as, as Rachel just said, we've seen the whole gamut. There are people who, uh, we've seen people uh, who have um, applied to get them removed from in front of their house. They don't want to, they find it too traumatic to see them every day. They, the, um, there was a case in the Netherlands that, uh, was reported in uh, in the media of a family that wanted them removed it because um, they were worried about property value. Um, so there and there's others who uh, see them spontaneously and say, "Wow, I want to see start doing research in my own house. I wonder who lived there." And they get very involved. So sometimes they're house project, neighborhood project, apartment building projects that um, are very grassroots and other times they're vandalized. So um, it's impossible to, to generalize. So we see everything, so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for, from, I'm afraid I'm going to mangle your name. A Jan Jansen? Correct me and tell me how to pronounce your name and ask your question. <laughs> yeah. I'm answering only because <clears throat> the Germans were addressed. And I'm probably the only German in this assembly here, it seems to me. So I have to respond. I didn't want to say anything. But um, <laughs> I can now say the Stolpersteiner, I saw them in the town of my birth in Düsseldorf first. And it reminded me what had happened in Germany. And it is and see it as a legacy of the greatest crime in recent his history and uh, something which we must never forget. That's all I wanted to say. Thank, thank, you. You, ver thank you very much. We have some further questions in the chat. I, I mean, some of which, um, pick up on the earlier discussion about sort of local initiatives. Um, Abigail asks, is there a loss of meaning if the government requested the stone instalment? The stones seem incredibly important as a personal connection. So is there any sort of loss felt because that personal request was not included? Uh, uh, there's a question about local authorities which forbid memorials, which um, has already been touched on by Rachel and Ruth. Um, and Sheila asks, we've encountered a local committee in Germany who sees these as being only people who died directly from the Nazi regime. Our mother was a hidden child. Is there any overarching committee that provides guidance? Hmm. We'd start with the last one first, Ruth. Yeah. I'm sure that you yeah. can add this as well. But yeah. It's not just for people who died, but for uh, in Gunter, Gunter's understanding is that it's for anyone whose life was seriously disrupted. So for example, we talked briefly about the kinder transport person who received a Stolperstein or Mokrau who, uh, who committed suicide later after he left Germany. So there's um, a num so it's, it's not his idea that it just be for people who died directly, yeah. Right. And the first question? <laughs> Remind me what the, um, what was the first question again? It was about it, um, if there's a loss of meaning, if the initiative comes from local authorities. I think it's oh, a great uh, question actually, uh, really, um, because we've looked at Norway where it is a, a, a national initiative, a government initiative, and um, it may very well be the case we haven't, I haven't explored that. Um, yeah. Although I will say that in every, we've been to many, many extremely rural Norwegian um, hamlets, villages um, in the Arctic Circle and in the South and where there where, where nobody in the town has ever met a Jew. Um, only uh, there's in some of the cases, some of the elderly people living there do remember some Jewish classmates and one case they even remembered them being taken away um 
And at each of those events, they were enormously well attended. Everyone in the town came. The local, the town choirs would come and sing. The mayors gave speeches. Um, uh, on a couple of occasions, um, descendants from one one occasion, descendants from Brazil were were flown in for it. The one had descendants from Israel come. Um, and so they, they were very, very important local events. So right. rather than loss sure. of meaning. Right. But the, Sorry? I think that's a really good point. It's also that was very specific to rural Norway, where there yes. was some Jew yeah. who once lived there for a time, and very, mm -hmm. very different in, in Oslo, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Although um, sometimes in Oslo, there have been, a, like Gunter will install maybe 10 during one day. and. And one time we there was uh, there were a couple of school classes of ten year old kids who made it kind of a day uh, a one day pilgrimage. They followed him from one place to the next to the next, picking flowers along the way, and had um, little mini seminars at each one about the pro about you know why were these children who were their age killed and and so um, I think these are these were unforgettable experiences for these kids. Um, other times there've been there's no one in attendance no. so so it's it, it's a mixture thank you sabine you have a question you're still you're still muted okay now right great okay. thank yes. you uh, so this was about a question um, asked some, well, some minutes ago uh, regarding um, that, as a matter of fact, in some towns, um, Stolperstein initiatives, it's no overall or central organization, are only uh, laid for persons who died. Um, so I'm from the town of Freiburg on the southwest of Germany. And in Freiburg, um, it is the principle of lives being disrupted one way or other. Mm -hmm. um, I have made the experience that in Berlin for survivors, um, it's being like sort of tested. Sorry about my English. In other towns though, notably Hamburg and Münster, there seems to be a rule that um, persons who survived um, slash emigrated are not eligible for Stolpersteiner. And um, this is not to, I don't know, to diss anybody, but personally, um, I think it's um, very, very difficult, must be even more difficult for the descendants. Um, I stumbled, literally stumbled upon this because I did some research into into persons' fates to facilitate Stolpersteine or kick them off or whatever. I don't know the correct word. And I think this is, I don't know. I think it's hard to understand that town A says, well, they must have died. Town B says, we'll look into it. And then there are towns um, who say, well, the disruption uh, principle works. Okay, so I just wanted to add this because I think it's actually, it's important. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take one more question now before going back to uh, Rachel and Ruth. Sydney Block, you have a question if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm unmuted, but I'm, I'm here in Australia, in Melbourne. Can you hear me? Um, even from Melbourne, oh, we can hear you. Even from Melbourne, well, I'm pleased. <laughs> Uh, firstly, a, a very quick thank you to Ruth and Rachel for a fascinating presentation. I personally have had a, a vague idea about this wonderful way of commemoration, but first time I've really heard about it. My question really relates to the Aboriginal community in Australia. You know, we have had a ghastly history of massacres and, and, and all the rest, and I won't go into that now. Um, but there is a heightened consciousness about how we can commemorate history of, of this um, kind. And I, I wonder if um, either Ruth or Rachel both have any thoughts 
about a community. Bear in mind that Aboriginals live mostly, or still live mostly in, or many of them in remote and regional places. So it's not as if they, you know, you go to a town like Melbourne and, and find places. Uh, any thoughts, um, any ideas that maybe we could use down here? Thank you, Sydney. And, and I'll just add one last question for, because it's an interesting, it's, it's a very interesting question in the chat um, for, from Robert Gordon, who picked up on the mention of Spielberg and the risks of cultural Americanization of the Holocaust. And he asks, is it fair to say that Stolper Steiner pushed back against this by rooting memory back in the home sites of Europe? So uh, Ruth and Rachel, th th these are sort of three rather large <laughs> sets of issues for you to, uh, uh, to deal with, but I'm sure you'll do your best. Hmm. Um, about, um, I'm sorry, I didn't remember your name, the woman from um, Sabine. Weiberg, was it? Sabine, yes, Sabine, thank you. Um, that's news to us and um, you can be rest assured we're going to look into that immediately. Um, that's, the, that's the first time we've ever heard of this kind of distinction between um, uh, survived with disrupted lives versus um, murdered. Um, and we have never experienced that distinction. Because well, I hate to contradict you, Ruth. Yeah. Oh, have we? <laughs> uh, okay, go ahead. No, but it, in our conversations in Norway, we were told that they were only placing stones for those people who died in concentration camps, who were yeah. killed, who were murdered, and not for the many, many people's lives who were disrupted. So that was a decision uh -huh. made by the people, not by a municipality, not by a government, but by the people who were sort of in charge of the installations. So it's, but it's something worth pressing back, you know, pushing back on. And the question about the, the museum, right? Right. So I'm just saying right. like, that was a decision, yeah. you know, that he said, I've got this many people I can document or whatever, and that's what I'm doing. So, that's you know, sometimes right. it's practicality. Yeah. 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 And the question about uh, the about the Aboriginal issue, I would turn it back to the way is some of these have been handled in the U.S. with enslaved people, and it's just placing a stone where people lived, or where maybe within with First Nations in Canada, they might do where people were educated or educated those schools that you know were so problematic. So there's many ways to adapt it. And the third question was about Spielberg, and I'll leave that one for Ruth. No, I think that it's a very, very um, percent. I don't think that's so much of a question as an excellent observation. And I think I would agree um, that, you know, this is an enormous contrast and it does have the potential of bringing the Holocaust back to where it started um, rather than letting it be hijacked by Hollywood. Despite the music we heard. <laughs> New Despite person. the music we heard, which we will never forget. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are out of time, unfortunately. But before we end, I would like to thank um, everyone uh, who has come today. Everyone, especially those of you who have contributed questions, um, either in the chat or, or speaking them yourselves. Uh, but above all, I would like to thank uh, Ruth and Rachel for sharing uh, your research and your findings and your analyses uh, with us. It's been, um, it's been a truly fascinating hour and I and everyone else um, is, are, are greatly in your debt. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your wonderful questions, given us a lot to think about.